thank you everybody for joining our session today. As Ashley mentioned, we are recording the session and uh, we look forward to answering questions today. Uh, if you are looking for a more streamlined presentation, perhaps something that meets your specific organization's needs, uh, if we don't address everything that you were looking for today, feel free to reach out to you to watch the presentation again. You're going to find my email address and uh, some more information about our sales and our uh, Interdyne BMI Dynamics 365 website as well uh, on the, our final slide. So what I'd like to do today is spend about 90 minutes with you. Uh, our format is going to be a little bit of PowerPoint where we explore the product functionality. I want to make sure everybody understands what the product is capable of. It's an exciting new product, but new is an operative word here. So Microsoft continues to add functionality every month. Some of the things you may be looking for may not immediately be available today, but as we talk about the roadmap and we explore what's going on out there in the marketplace, you may find that in very short order, Microsoft or through some of the applications developed for the product, it may be able to address your organization's specific needs. From that uh, initial PowerPoint presentation, we'll jump into an overview of the product, and I'm going to show you Dynamics 365 for Financials live. And uh, upon completion of that, we'll open up the floor to some Q&A, uh, and uh, from there, we'll start wrapping up. So that's uh, how we intend to spend the next 90 minutes. Uh, let's go ahead and continue on with uh, our PowerPoint then. So Microsoft Dynamics 365 for Financials, it's a uh, true SaaS solution that's hosted in Microsoft's Azure Cloud. And what you'll find is beyond just the business or ERP functionality that you might be looking for, back office functionality you're looking for, Dynamics 365 has a lot of built-in integrations to uh, productivity apps like Office. And if you have Office 365, it'll work even better. It is by and far part of that larger Microsoft 365 story, uh, bringing to bear everything that's cloud-based, that's, uh, you know, always on, always in the cloud, take it in your pocket wherever you go type of narrative. What Microsoft has done too is created a marketplace, much like you go to your app source, uh, or your, sorry, your app stores on your phones, your tablets, et cetera. Uh, they've created a marketplace for extended functionality for Dynamics 365 for financials, and it's called Microsoft App Source. If you go to App Source, you'll find uh, a lot of offerings that are either uh, trial first and then buy, so try to buy. Some are still complimentary and some you have to pay a monthly fee for. So that's how you can extend capabilities at Dynamics 365 for financials. What you'll find too on the left is I've got uh, some key applications that Microsoft has developed. They offer that as additional components within the Office 365 suite. So when we think Office, normally we think Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and uh, you'd expect that a solution like Dynamics 365 for financials would obviously work really well with Excel, Word, and Outlook, and it does. But beyond those, tools like Power BI, for instance, let's start with that. That's a very popular tool in Microsoft's stack today, uh, and it, it serves the purpose of KPI, visualization, business intelligence, and reporting. It is Microsoft's go-to tool for Dynamics 365's custom reports or business intelligence requirements. You'll find, too, in addition to Power BI, we have something called Power Apps. And that's another tool that Microsoft's developed. It's gaining a lot of steam because it allows you to create apps unique to your business without writing any code. So take Dynamics 365 for financials data, you'd be able to create applications and you'd be able to deliver them securely to people within your organization who can utilize those. Further, if you look at the uh, Microsoft Flow icon below, Microsoft Flow is another really exciting tool which focuses on creating workflows that transcend multiple applications. Dynamics 365 for financials has its own workflow capability. But in addition to that, uh, Microsoft Flow allows us to create workflows that perhaps start in another application or service and then terminate in Dynamics 365 for financials or start in Dynamics 365 and terminate in another application. And then finally, Microsoft is doing a lot of research and development around um, machine learning and predictive analysis. And that is being offered to you in the, uh, under the branding called Cortana Intelligence Suite. So when you see this, I don't want you to think of those telephone assistants that you probably know, like the Cort hey Cortana, hey Siri. We're talking about something different here. We're talking about the ability to take four to five months here, four to five months of historical data and translate that into better cash flow forecasts. Translate that into the ability to predict when you're going to run out of inventory or, or forecast uh, sales into the future. 
So those are some of the things that Microsoft is bringing to uh, you uh, to benefit from in addition to standard general ledger tables and receivables functionality. Now, what you'll notice is some of these tools can be installed on premise. So you could have office applications like your Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You don't have to be using the web applications. So those tools would exist on the left-hand side, uh, you know, on premises or in the cloud. But your back office system or Dynamics 365 for financial specifically resides entirely in the cloud. So there is no software for you to install. There is no server software. Uh, there is nothing to, uh, you know, no days of setup and so on. You'll find you go and sign on to it, much like you signed on for an email address or signed on to some sort of uh, other cloud-based service you utilize heavily. And the way you access Dynamics 365 for financials is primarily through a web browser. So Chrome, Safari, Firefox, or Microsoft's uh, Internet Explorer or Edge, they'd all work fine as long as you've got the latest versions. And there's no plugin to install in those browsers. It just works. It works with HTML5 technology. If you're out and about on the road, you can also access Dynamics 365 uh, on a dedicated app that you can download for Apple, Android, or Microsoft uh, tablets or phones. So it works across all of those popular devices that you use, the ones uh, that you use at the workplace and the ones you always carry with you on, on all the time. And there's no extra cost for using the tablet or the phone apps. The apps themselves are free to download and licensing wise, once you are a user in Dynamics 365 for financials, your user account allows you to use one or any or all three of those applications. So you can start your day on the phone by checking a couple of key reports, get to the office, work on the browser, and then if you're out and about visiting a customer, you may perhaps pull out the tablet to take an order. In terms of functionality, what Dynamics 365 for financials can do for you uh, of course, it can do financial management. That's where it all starts. The product is called Financials. As a matter of fact, Microsoft is just uh, in the process of rebranding the product a little bit to better define it. So now calling it Microsoft Dynamics 365 for Financials and Operations Business Edition. And they specifically mention Business Edition because they also have a much uh, more complex set of offerings under the Enterprise Edition banner. But today we're looking at the business edition functionality. They're really uh, you know, quick to deliver, quick to deploy type of capability. So in that we have financials and fixed assets management, inventory management, selling and purchasing. Now, if you are a company that does professional services and not inventory, you'd still be served well. If you're selling inventory, you'd be served well with the product as well. If you're a project-based organization, you'll find that jobs and project accounting is native to Dynamics 365 for functionality. As a matter of fact, on the inventory side, the system can even do some light assembly or kitting capability. So if you need to kit some products together, or if you're doing some very light manufacturing where you're going to uh, utilize kitting or assembly management, you could utilize that with this product. Of course, credit management, CRM capabilities, optical character recognition for incoming payments and payables management. Those are all native to the system. And finally, like any good accounting or back office system, there is reporting capability, analysis capability, and business intelligence capability built in with this offering. The system is fully integrated with a lot of different applications out of the box, and it's integration ready as well. So if you want to integrate to your own applications or some other business specific application that you'd like to maintain, web services allows us to do that. Uh, we could take data out from financials and put them into another system or take data out from another system and import them to Dynamics 365 for financials using web services. But you'll find that it's already integrated with Office 365. It's integrated with uh, CRM, uh, or it's a standalone CRM solution from Microsoft, which is called Microsoft Dynamics 365 for sales. Now notice that it does have some built-in relationship or built-in CRM capabilities as well, if you have basic needs. It integrates out of the box with uh, bank data feeds and uh, bank data file imports and exports. So you could quickly and seamlessly manage your bank reconciliations and incoming payment reconciliation, et cetera. And then we also have click to pay capabilities through PayPal. So with your invoices, you could include a link or uh, you could basically have a button that they can push on the interactive view of the invoice if you're sending them an email, um, or you could show them the uh, URL on a printed out invoice. 
and the customers would be able to go to that URL or click on that URL and immediately pay you for those outstanding invoices that they are sending to them. This allows you to quickly collect on those receivables. Lexmark OCR or optical character recognition allows you to seamlessly import and then uh, send to an OCR service or the Lexmark OCR service those incoming payment invoices. So vendors send you a, a, a an invoice, you'd like to register that in the system, perhaps it needs to go through some approvals, you have five or six lines in those invoices, you don't want to have to type them every time. Reduce the possibility of human error and you would do that with Lexmark OCR and it's all built into the system. As I mentioned before, this is a true SaaS product and uh, what this means to us is you never have to, or means to you, is that you never have to worry about upgrading. There is no, what version am I on today? You're always on the latest version. Now, beyond that though, you do perhaps want to keep on top of what functionality Microsoft is adding to the product, and they do so at a monthly interval. So almost every month by about the 10th or the 15th of the month, Microsoft releases some new features. And you can check on those at any given time by going to roadmap.dynamics.com, this URL right over here. And so as you go over there, notice that I'll have a little button here called Dynamics 365 for financials. Here I can look at the features that are in development. I can see things that have just been added, and I can see things that are already part of the software capability. And this way, if you're curious, can the product do this? The latest and greatest information is available in the roadmap site. Is Microsoft about to develop something? You can go to the in-development queue. Those in-development queue items are typically functionality, pieces of functionality that we've observed uh, get released within about 30 to 90 days after they're placed on the in-development list. So a lot of times that Microsoft will add something within about a month to three months, we find that that capability finds its way into the what's new queue. So that's a way for you to keep on, keep on top, plan and prepare for what's gonna come down the pipeline. <laughs> So with that, what I'd like to do is jump into our Microsoft Dynamics 365 for Financials um, web browser and do some product functionality review. Let's go ahead and end the slideshow for now. Now I am logging in using my Google Chrome browser today. You of course may prefer to use a different browser. I've gotten timed out, so I'm just signing back in. I'm logged in as a business manager within an organization. The business manager role center, or my home screen, allows me to stay on top of uh, sales, purchases, payments, and everything. Now, in my last demonstration, I had hidden some stuff for sales. But if you want to bring some key sales information on your screen as well, you can go to your activities and say, show or hide activities, show me my sales activities. And here you go. It'll show me some important information. These blue tiles that are on my screen are called activity queues, and they give us counts of documents, or they show us a scorecard. It might show us some dollar-based value, and it allows us to stay on top of really important information for our business. Now, as a business manager, of course, you're seeing all of these things. <coughs> if within your organization, you have people who are uh, managing a specific area of your business, you could, of course, go to an area called profiles, and manage and select a different profile. So each profile would have its own unique role center. So I have things like a business manager, um, order processor, project manager, sales and relationship manager, somebody who manages security, et cetera. So all of those things are completely native to the solution and completely pre-prepared. And now once you're there and you've selected another role center for yourself or assigned it to somebody else, what you'd be able to do at that point in time is have that person log in and your experience is going to be completely tailored to what you've selected so that your home screen is reflective of it. Now, another thing I want to point out is that I am logged in as a full user in the system. So how is the system licensed? Well, there are two different <coughs> types of licenses. Uh, one is called a full user and one's called a light user. And a full user, let me go ahead and bring one related slide to that actually. Wouldn't be a bad idea to talk about it now. So my full user licenses in Dynamics 365 for financials are priced at $40 a user a month. And they let you read, write, or post any transactions to the general ledger. And uh, <coughs> these are named users. So if you have five people in the company who need to access it, you would buy, and they need full user license access, you'd pay $40 times five. 
There's also another license type called the light user license. Some documentation also refers to it as the team member user license. And this is a very inexpensive license because it allows us to read or access data primarily, but isn't really designed for people who are doing a lot of data entry. If you are just entering your time or you're performing some approvals of workflow documents, or you are just keying in a quick sales quote or uh, you know, changing a customer record or something like that, you may be able to do those with a five user license. These are also named. <coughs> a lot of our customers who use Dynamics 365 for financials also use external accounting services. You may have a CPA who's external to your organization who either does all of your bookkeeping or perhaps uh, provides oversight and audit. For those types of uh, users, you do get one free accountant user license at no charge. So that's why it's not shown over here. It's at no charge. It's a complimentary license for anybody who's a subscriber for Dynamics 365 for financials. In terms of deployment, Interdyne VMI has created a few implementation plans. So we know that a lot of folks who are trying to deploy Dynamics 365 for financials are startups. Uh, you know, they have a lot of energy and they're very uh, <coughs> let me do it myself type. And so if you are one of the DIY folks, this option works great for you. You'll find in the solution when I go back to my home screen, there are quite a few <coughs> Microsoft created videos and there's a lot of uh, training or learning material within the product itself, both in the form of help documentation or guided tours, assisted setups and so on. Uh, where you do get stranded or you need help, we are able to provide you help in a time and materials basis with this plan. So for customers who want to get the best of both worlds, uh, you know, they do want to do it themselves, but they also want some help and guidance, uh, they go with our fixed price offering called Smart Start. Uh, this is a really good value at $3,995. And with this plan, we typically can take you live using best practices in two to four weeks. And so we provide you accelerated training on how you can migrate your data, how you can do processes, some key processes. And after that, you go on and repeat those, uh, your learnings from the training to get your data in, and you're up and running in very limited amounts of time. As a matter of fact, if you really wanted to with Smart Start, you could go live in two weeks or less. But most customers have their businesses to run, and so a transition might not be uh, you know, shorter than that time frame. For those of our clients who want more uh, help above and beyond Smart Start, uh, perhaps you want additional rounds of training or so on, there's also additional help available. And we do provide support services as well. So if you need assistance after you go live or you need additional assistance during your, uh, your implementation, we can provide you that at time and material as well. And then finally, there are some of our clients who want more hand-holding, a more consultative approach. Perhaps they want uh, not just to follow system-driven best practices, but uh, do a business process review and then determine where the fit and the, you know, where there are uh, gaps and where there's the fit and uh, perhaps work through that. So we have another option called Advanced Start, very flexible. You know, our typical Advanced Start implementations are, you, we've seen them go between like, about 50 hours in the lower side to maybe about 170 hours or so on the higher side. So we're still talking a fairly inexpensive and a fairly quick implementation. Even those tend to happen within a month to two months. So, uh, you know, this isn't a, you know, we're going to spend years implementing this product with somebody sitting in your office, this type of deal. So let's go back to the Dynamics 365 for Financials web browser. Now here when I was logged in as a business manager, I mentioned to you that uh, we have these product videos and you know guided tours, et cetera. So if you intend to get started by yourself or want to learn what the product can do, you can go to this show the getting started guide again. Now I've already viewed this once, but if you were to do this, it's going to pop up the getting started guide. And it takes you through six or seven different guided tours that you could use within the uh, uh, within this product. So there's the welcome tour, there's the how do I invoice, how do I view the item master, et cetera. And then Microsoft's also created some really nice training videos. We'll have that take a quick second, it will pop up. And the product videos will show you uh, pre-recorded videos from Microsoft. Now, Interdyne BMI also has some self-prepared or curated videos that you could re reference and benefit from, but these are right within the product as you are 
uh, looking at and uh, you know provides you some quick assistance with uh, using your data migration tools to get data from an external system, how to work with financials and year end closing, how to perform reporting, workflows, etc. So this is all some very good uh, help to get you up and running. On your home screen, let's do a little bit of a review of the components. We talked about activity queues. I don't remember if we talked about these color bars or these enhanced uh, indicators. What these are meant to do is provide a little more attention and focus on the things that are getting out of hand. You'll find I've got some colors in green. I may or may, no, I don't have anything in yellow here. And I have some bars in red. Immediately, as you uh, log into the system, you can start focusing on the ones that are red because these are uh, probably bad trends that you need to arrest. My overdue purchase invoice amounts, boy, we're, we're owing our vendors more money right now and we need to uh, start issuing our checks out. Um, our overdue sales invoice amount, maybe we do a million dollars in sales volume. Uh, in that, you know, about $72,000 probably uh, doesn't reflect a, a huge amount and that's fine, we'll, we'll reach out to them, but it's not really critical. As you go through these, you can either empower your users to manage these uh, ranges, or you could actually create and manage the ranges as an administrator. So over here, if I were to look at my overdue uh, sales invoice amount, you see I've set a range that says below 100,000 will show up in green, between 100,000 and 150,000 shows up in yellow, and anything above 150 shows up in red. And just by changing these ranges, the color bars or the enhanced indicators will follow suit. On the right-hand side, uh, you'll notice I've got some charts and graphs. So these are basically, a, this is a carousel of charts and graphs. So I can go from either my top customers, as I hover over any of these, I can see some information or click on it and get some more detail. I can move to my next chart. Some of these are financial type of charts. And you'll find that I might have a P&L chart. I might have a cash flow chart, et cetera, that I could uh, review. And as I go down to further, you'll find that I've got a trial balance that I could always uh, you know, track. So financial reports right on my home screen. Uh, let me get rid of this PowerPoint for now. And then, and then as I look over here on my right-hand side, you find that I've got a reporting box. Now, I've just automated my age accounts payable report to run uh, at certain time, points in time. And so I don't have to run that age AP report every day. It will automatically run at 3.21 p.m. on certain days of the week and then delivers that on my home screen. So if I need to come here and I just need to run some of my key reports, I could always just click here and view the report and it will immediately download it. So even if this report had 20, 30 pages, it downloads really quick because it's already been processed in the system. Now here I can see my HDP report. Of course, if I wanted to change the way this report looks, I can use my report layout tools like Microsoft Word or a Visual Studio Report Designer and I could completely change the look and feel of this report. Coming back to my screen, the way you could schedule a report, so if you find a certain report in the system that you want to schedule, you could do that, uh, or you could just select one. I, I'll come over here and say, show my queue. The way you would do it for another one, let's just go ahead and pick this one, see how we did it. We selected our report, either with a name or a number. We decided when the earliest date and time it would, uh, it, would it would start running at. We defined some options. We said there's request page options, which allows us to then uh, select you know, what date ranges to run from, what uh, length of aging periods should be, print detail or not, et cetera, and set any filters. And then we said the output would be PDF and we selected the date. So it's running on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays at 3.21 p.m. And we set it to ready. That's all. You don't need IT help. You don't need to write any code to automate things. And this job queues area feeds a report inbox. And this is where all your uh, scheduled reports will run and deliver. Just like that, when you log into the system, whether it's one or 20 reports that you rely on every day, you'll find they'll be out there ready for you to view. Moving to uh, a little bit more around navigation, notice in the ribbon, you'll find contextually applicable items based on either the role center you're logged into uh, or based on the list view that you're seeing. So on my home screen here, I'm seeing some quick links to create a quote and order or a purchase order, purchase invoice, et cetera, or create a new customer or vendor. 
I also have some quick links as, uh, as I see over here to quickly view some financial statements. Now what Microsoft has done with Dynamics 365 for financials is it allows you to take your chart of accounts or use a best practices chart of accounts that you can classify into different types. An account could be a balance sheet account or an income statement account. It could be if it were a balance sheet account, an asset, a liability or an equity account. And then below that, you can create your own subcategories. Just by assigning accounts to the appropriate categories and subcategories, Microsoft is able to give you out of the box financials. You could run a balance sheet within a day of having your, you know, your transactions brought in or as soon as you rather you bring in your account structure and your uh, historical numbers or you start entry if you're, you know, starting from scratch. As soon as you have a transaction in there, the system can start showing you balance sheet and income statement, a statement of cash flows, a statement of retained earnings or sales tax collected type reports. You come over here, you select the desired report. Now, if you have run it before and you had some filters you had set before, the system even remembers those. It'll tell me, do you want to use those last used report options and filters? Fine, I'll do that. And these were the filters. And I'm going to say send to and I'll send it in a PDF format. Now the system will run it on the server and then give me a file that I can just download. Um, there you go. I'm gonna go ahead and just open this PDF. So this is a default view of an income statement. Now you might look at this and go, well, I like my P&L with some more detail. Or maybe you're a not-for-profit and you say, well, I don't really call this an income statement. You know, we call this a net assets report and we needed to report a little bit differently. The categories need to, to be named differently and that's fine. You can always go and use a report writer within the system, the financial report writer, to create your own versions of financial reports. And I'll show you a little bit of that as well. But these allow you to hit the ground running really quickly just with uh, limited uh, setup. Now, as I go down over here and click on home, you'll find I've got these different functional areas that I can navigate to. When you're setting up the system, go to setup and extensions, and what you will see is all the different types of setup screens. You'll find assisted setups that Microsoft has created. You'll find some manual setups when you want to be, if you're a power user and you want to set up your sales, your financials, and your purchasing modules a certain way, you could use all those advanced options. But notice over here in the assisted setup, there's some quick wizards. If you want to set up approval workflows, you could do that really quickly. So let's say I want to set up approval workflows. I follow this wizard. We're going to hit next. Do we want to set up a purchase invoice or a sales invoice approval workflow? Let's say we want to set up a purchase invoice approval workflow. We'll say next. Who is the approver? I'm going to select. Well, I don't, didn't set up any important users. So let's grab and set up a few of my users. Let's say, well, this is a one user system at this time. But that's fine. I'm just going to key in my user email address as well. Okay. And is there a limit? I could say if there are purchase invoices that exceed $500, this is the uh, limit at <coughs> which we might require an <coughs> approval, or $5,000. And then hit next, and the setup is, is finished. Now, if I had multiple levels, I could go in and I could uh, go to the approval screen. I could say if it's below 500, it's okay. If it's between 500 to 1,000, uh, you know, Bob approves 1,000 to 1,500, Tina approves and so on. Or I might have multiple approvers. Maybe my approvals aren't dollar-based. Every invoice needs to be reviewed, not by one people, but by two. And every check before it's printed needs to be approved and so on. But notice how simple it was for me to follow these assisted setups. So there's a lot you can do by yourself, get Outlook connected, uh, do some email logging uh, setups, and get CRM connected if you're using the external reporting capabilities. And then <coughs> Microsoft has also created some first party applications and integrations called service connections. Those are the ones that I had in that little view called pre-integrated. So if you wanted to set up OCR, you could just go ahead and run through that initial setup. You wanna go ahead and get your bank feed set up so that you uh, just put in your bank username and password, and then it automatically starts getting bank data into financials. Come here and run this wizard. You see how easy these steps are. And then the App Source Store. You can either go to the <coughs> Microsoft App Source Store um, in your browser, or you can go to, from here called the Extension Marketplace, and it will load up uh, the App Source within financials. So 
Here you can see these are some of the apps that are available for Dynamics 365 for financials. You keep scrolling down. If you like something, say get it now. Uh, you'll see some detail behind it. If you're trying to uh, integrate Expensify to Dynamics 365, you can read some more information. You can then install this if you have the permissions or see some videos or learn more about the solution. So very easy for you to add an app <laughs> if you're an administrator. Almost think of it as how you would install an application on your phone or your tablet from those modern app stores. None of the, you don't have to do anything about, you know, merging code or reaching out to somebody for, uh, you know, how do we buy it and this or that or the other. It's all within the product. And if you do need to pay, uh, in some cases, the payment information can be entered directly into the app. There might be others where the vendor will contact you and uh, they will uh, arrange to make sure that you're paying your subscription set properly. Just want to take a quick break for water. Now, these are some of the extensions that I already have in place. I've set up my Serene payroll import or my click to pay from PayPal and some QuickBooks data migration, sales and inventory forecasts as well. Now, come back to my home screen again. If you're looking to find something in the system, you'll find that there's a search bar or there's that search icon or magnifying glass that's available right here on my screen. Now, when I'm clicking on that search icon, I can then type in a menu. I can type in vendors, customers, report name, anything that I'm interested in. So if I were looking for, say, my list of, uh, perhaps I'm a project-based business and I'm looking for my list of resources, so people, my billable resources, and I can come to this list just like that. So I type that in. Or I might type in age accounts payable report or something or the other, and that's how I'd be able to get to that. I want to show you a really neat feature next about uh, around taking transactions. Now, of course, if you wanted to create a quote or an order or a PO, an invoice, those are all native to the system, right? And so if I were just creating a simple uh, purchase order to buy something, I would say new purchase order. I might be interested in buying some inventory product. I could type in my vendor's name or the vendor's number, right? I type that in, and then I could select the product that I'm interested in buying. Perhaps it's I'm um, buying some chairs, um, you know, say what warehouse I needed to go to. If I had any warehouses, actually, I remembered that I didn't set up any warehouses here. And then I could say what quantity. And if I've got any special prices already associated with the, uh, with the cost, with this, uh, in the system, uh, it would automatically remember how much I bought it for last time. Or if my vendor had some specific pricing that they were providing, it would automatically fill that in. Now over here, I put in my vendor's, uh, shipment number or invoice number if they're applicable. When the product arrives, I can go and post and receive this product or send an approval workflow and so on. Or actually more appropriately, let me just get a PO out before we go too far. Okay. So I wanna get this PO out to my vendor. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna create a PDF attachment here. And uh, depending on how this vendor was set up, um, if this vendor does require or has some predefined uh, content in an email body, they'll populate that as well on the screen, and then I'll be able to send that out. Now, I notice when I work with GoToWebinar and I'm recording sessions, my Google Chrome tends to give me some problems, so, or any browser really for that matter tends to slow things down. Uh, but as I go through this, just give it a quick moment to pull that detail up. Uh, see, we can set up our email sentence correctly, so it doesn't know how to send an email yet. Uh, but here, I can download that. And this is a copy for PO. Maybe I have a logo up here. Maybe I have some more detail. Your PO format can look completely different than this. And I could then email this as well. And what we've done with Dynamics 365, or rather what Microsoft has done, is allowed you other ways to create transactions as well. So if here I go into my Outlook, you can see I may have a request for a quote. I may have an invoice from a vendor. I may have, uh, you know, uh, some sales documents. Uh, somebody sends me an order confirmation, and I might just need to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that I'm then taking the next step to uh, to act upon it. Whatever it is, as my emails arrive in Outlook, I can view them and then act upon them. So here, 
I sent a sample invoice where we purchased some office supplies. So a chair, not for inventory this time, but perhaps as an office supply, uh, we, we broke a chair, we broke some casters, we needed a replacement. The vendor sends me some detail. Now uh, this email address of mine is registered in the system associated with the vendor. I can obviously see in the body, it says please see your invoice for your purchase of one chair for 192.80. If I wanted to look at this PDF to just verify uh, what it is that they sent me, I can open this up and I see this uh, invoice from the vendor. And uh, this is how the click to pay functionality with PayPal will look like. So if you were uh, you know, utilizing this and sending it out to your customers, they would see something like this and they would then click this particular screen. You'll notice it would take them to the, uh, to the kind of the PayPal payments page. They would be able to log in or just enter your credit card payment information and, and off they would go to pay you. Let's go back to that invoice. Now here in this example, what we were trying to do is record this invoice from the vendor. So we, we saw the detail around it, we saw the PDF. Notice that I have a Dynamics link right over here in my Outlook. Now this works on the web, it also works on my installed version of Outlook. So if you actually uh, use the installed applications, the functionality would work just the same. I'm gonna click on this Dynamics Nav uh, section and this will log me into my Dynamics 365 for financials. Navigates into that, takes me into my uh, screen over here. What it's doing is checking to see if this email address is registered with a customer, with a vendor, or anybody else in the system. If it's not, it would give me the option to register this user uh, as a new contact or as a new customer or new vendor or something like that. Uh, if it does find it, it will automatically show me the list of everything associated with the entity. So here, it's located aj.ansari at enterdine bmi as a contact for first step consultants and it's showing me some associated vendor statistics i can see what my outstanding orders are how much i have in outstanding invoices what my total balance is and anything in blue is information i can click and drill down into detail you also see a quick overview of hdp or some other types of views by week month quarter year and then scroll to the right and you'll see some details transaction accounts if I clicked on any one of these, it would drill me down into and show me more detail around that list. We want to just record this invoice, right? So without leaving Outlook, I can just go to my new button here and say, I want to record this as a new purchase invoice. Notice I could have also recorded a purchase order or purchase credit memo, et cetera. So I can just say new, and then it takes me to the screen associated with the purchase invoice and will automatically populate the information pertaining to the vendor and anything that needs to be recorded from the vendor master. So you see that already here, the vendor name, the contact detail. I just need a key in the invoice number. Now I've already keyed this invoice number in a bunch of times in previous demos, so I'm gonna just make a little bit of a change. The system does require uniqueness with, uh, with invoice numbers for each vendor for very obvious reasons. Now here I could say, am I recording this as an inventory purchase or I actually want to record this as an office supplies purchase. I'm going to book it against a general ledger account. But oh wait, I don't remember my office supplies account number. Let's look up the value. So type in office, office supplies expense, then go to my quantity and I type in the cost. Now, if there was any approval required, I could have come down over here. Remember we'd set up an approval. In this case, the approval wouldn't trigger because it's less than 500 or 5,000, whatever the amount was that we'd set. But if it weren't, then we would have said send approval request and it would send an approval request out to uh, the approver. And uh, the status would have changed on that document to pending approval. In this particular case, I should just be able to go ahead and post this and record this in the system. Uh, it's still telling me that I just need to kind of, uh, as a matter of formality, push it through the approval, it should automatically approve and allow me to carry on. So once you have approval set up, it does require that you at least uh, you know, do the steps re requisite for the workflow to kick in. But it didn't send any approval notifications, it was below the amount. And just like that, now the invoice has been recorded in the system. So if I were to go back into Dynamics 365 for financials, I would be able to see an invoice recorded with our internal reference number or with this number in the system right away. So very simple, very easy to manage. You never have to leave your Outlook. A lot of the transaction stuff that you do can be managed right over there within your, uh, within your, your Outlook and your mail. 
So here I could see, for instance, if I go to the vendor balance, this should have that most recent invoice, 108214, uh, that we booked. And this had a had the vendor's invoice reference of uh, INV1030200-8 that I just booked and posted. So in real time, it's recording all of this detail. Now, one other thing that I could have done is if I were using optical character recognition in Dynamics 365 for financials, I could have also set up uh, or sent this directly to the OCR service. So right over here, I could have said, send to OCR, taking the attachment or send to incoming documents and then send to OCR and it would have taken care of that. I'll do a very quick overview of that OCR capability uh, because of our time limitation, I won't be able to go through the entire workflow of, around it. But let's just go to my home screen. So home and home takes me to my main uh, role center. <coughs> and on my role center, you'll find there will be a screen associated with incoming documents management. Let's just scroll down a little bit and you'll see incoming documents from my incoming documents. Let's go ahead and click on this list. And here I could say create something from file. I'm going to choose. Let me drag this up so that quickly and easily find on my second monitor the document that I'd like to send to the OCR service. There you go. So here is a actually the very same document we uh, transacted within the email. I'm going to use that same one to uh, send to and manage in the OCR area. So once you uh, go ahead and you upload this file, <coughs> or if you were using a tablet or a phone, you could have also taken a picture uh, of, if you had a printed out invoice, used your phone camera or your tablet camera to take a picture of that invoice, and you could also work with that instead of a PDF document. Now I set this up, and then if I've got my OCR uh, setup complete, I've got an account set up with Lexmark, I can hit send to OCR service, and it will do that. And uh, I could then have another workflow that's automatically set up that allows me to automatically receive 30 minutes later or five seconds later. Usually I've, I've seen that the turnaround for most of these OCRs is about 30 seconds to a minute. So we could then receive manually or the system can automatically check and receive the OCR detail. If there's any errors, you can correct the OCR data. Otherwise it'll populate all these fields based on what's in the invoice. And if you've set up the appropriate workflow, it can automatically create the purchase invoice without you having to do anything. So these are all workflows that you can set up. So I've basically started the process. Uh, when it's been fully set up, I'd be able to then just say, go ahead and uh, you know, have it be sent for additional approvals or whatever the case may be. So speaking of workflows and approvals, let's talk about that a little bit. You saw me create one approval. Well, let's jump a little bit into workflows. Microsoft's created a variety of workflow templates that you could start off with and then build on those to uh, create your own workflows. So right now, for instance, I was working with some OCR documents and there's some OCR related workflows as well that I could start off with. So for instance, if we were doing the, if we wanted to create some automation around the OCR capability, here's one that says when an incoming document is received from OCR, maybe automatically create a purchase document. If it's successfully created, do nothing. If it fails, then create a notification for the user. So multiple steps in the workflow. Or if you wanted invoice approval or purchase order approval workflows, for instance, you could say, uh, start with this template. So these are event condition responses, right? So an event is if an approval of a purchase document is requested and the document type is in order and the status is open. If I see a plus here, it means there are multiple steps underneath this. So add a record restriction, send it for uh, set status depending approval, uh, and then create an approval request. And I could have different types of approval requests. You see over here, I could either have it an approver by a salesperson, approver specifically is defined as a master approver, or somebody in a workflow user group. And I could have a chain uh, of approvers based on limit types or so on. Uh, and then what happens after the approval set, you know, is there any targeted response? And you can create your own lines in here as well. So if I said, you know, I like this workflow, boy, I'd like to actually build a workflow around this template. So I come over here and say, create a new workflow from this template.
and the system is going to create a new workflow and I simply make the changes that I need within it. If I want to add another step or two or change some of the conditions associated with the workflow, I could then make it my own and uh, enable it and the system will start following it. So now here, I like this, but maybe I want to add an extra step. I come over here and then select an extra step from more events that the system has listed over here and then select some more conditions, some more responses, and then I just mark this enabled. That's how simple it is for you to work for work from uh, workflows. If you find somebody's created a really nice workflow or you've created a really nice workflow and you want to share it with somebody, not within your organization, because within your organization, you would already, uh, once you created, everybody would be able to see it, but external, or if you're looking at an outside resource and you like it, you can also import workflows from files or export them to files. So that was a quick overview of uh, workflows in the system. What I like to do is maybe delve a little bit into the financials management area. Let's talk about what makes financials in Dynamics 365 unique. Um, you'll find that as I show you my chart of accounts, that we've got a very streamlined general ledger. So if I click on my chart of accounts on the left-hand side, I'm going to see my natural account numbers here. There's a little bit of indentation that you see around my name column. I have a, uh, you know, my total uh, balance sheet type of a reference, and there's assets within those. Uh, I find my assets indented a little bit to the right. Notice too that the things that are marked uh, that are not in bold will have a type of posting. These indicate that these are my actual accounts. These are some log logical or for organization purposes. They help me manage my structure. You don't have to do it. It's a good practice because it allows for really good ad hoc reporting. Anytime you need to see something around total assets, you can see there is a reference. Total assets are from this account number to this account number. So in a financial report, when I'm running the using the report writer, I could just call this number here, and it would get me my you know balance of date uh, for the total assets uh, that, that I've got set up. The numbers, as I look to the right hand side, by the way, I can also arrange and organize my columns. So let's just say quick choose columns. And uh, you know, if I want to see some more heights, some I can manage those. But then, as I scroll to the right, you'll see I've got net change and balance of date showing for each of these numbers. So for my accounts receivable, I'd like to see a little bit more behind this balance of date. I click here, and then this shows me how I got to each of these transactions, or how I got to that number. And then within that, I can click on any one of these rows and say I would like to see a little bit more associated with it. So, what is this transaction? I could see a little more detail over here. It can show me the general ledger entry. I think I'd created this from an invoice or a journal entry. It will tell me that type of the detail. I can also see, you know, for any given transaction in the system, just like that, all the detail. If I wanted to, I click on the number of entries and it would show me the underlying detail behind it. When you're navigating, notice that I can also find things by a business contact or I can find something by serial numbers or lot numbers if I wanted to. So if you are in the system, instead of running and looking at the chart of accounts, uh, somebody says, hey, what's the status on invoice X, Y, or Z? Uh, or, you know, can you tell me what's going on with this product? You could always just come to the navigate screen and you could search either with an invoice number or you could say with the vendor's invoice number, the customer PO number, et cetera. You'd be able to find documents that way as well. Coming back to my chart of accounts, now that we've seen my native or my core accounts structure, let's just drill down into one of my account cards. This is where I can define uh, in the GL master for any given account, whether it's part of a balance sheet or an income statement. I can look at what category it falls under. I can have some user defined subcategories that I follow. And also for control purposes, the system allows me to restrict or allow posting from journal entries to certain accounts. It's very important when you're setting up your system to prevent scenarios where somebody post from a journal to an AR account or an AP account or an inventory account. Because when you do that, you open up the door for uh, a mismatched general ledger and the sub ledger, right? All AR transactions should come from customer invoices being posted. All uh, inventory, uh, anything that hits the inventory general ledger account should come from true sales or purchases or adjustments uh, to the inventory from the inventory module. You don't want people directly booking credits and debits to that GL account from a, from a general journal. So you can use direct posting. If you uncheck that, the system will prevent anybody from doing a journal entry to the account. As you're looking at an account, you can look at account balance or balance by dimension. And this brings us to a very important topic in Dynamics Nav or Dynamics 365 for financials. Now, for 
those of you who uh, have been following, there may be a couple of places where you saw the word NAV. In fact, when Ashley was introducing me, she even mentioned I'm the product manager for Dynamics NAV and Dynamics 365 for financials. Let me just go off on a slight tangent and uh, point out that those are separate products from Microsoft, but they're very similar to each other. Microsoft derived Dynamics 365 from financials from uh, using a lot of the functionality that's in Dynamics NAV. So it started off from that code base, but these are two separate products now and they both get separately developed, but there are a lot of commonalities between the two. So you will see from references here and there, or you might occasionally have me uh, you know, have a slip of the tongue and say NAV instead of Dynamics 365 for financials. But we are talking about financials today. So now, as I'm looking at my chart of accounts, you might see one thing that's conspicuously missing that you may have in your systems today, segments. You may have an account number, dash, two or three characters, or maybe four or five characters for a segment like department. You might have another dash and another four to five characters for another uh, segment like project, territory, or something else. And you use those to get your P&L or to kind of get some financial reporting and analysis broken down by those segments. While that's a fantastic benefit of segments, one of the downsides of uh, using segments is that your chart of accounts keeps growing exponentially large. Every time you add a new department, by necessity, you would have to create an entire complement of chart of, uh, of accounts in the general ledger. Every account that needs that department, you would have to create a combination of that account and department code. And probably you've got another uh, segment like territory or product group or something else. Now you've got to create even more. It becomes hard to manage. Dynamics 365 addresses that by keeping your chart of accounts very nominal and straightforward and then using a functionality called dimensions to track what you probably know today as segments. So if you're coming from the Dynamics GP world or coming from some other external systems, uh, you would want to think of these as a replacement for your segments. You still get the full benefit of everything you did with segments though. Departments, for instance, over here, or divisions, I've got a few uh, up here. Each of these is user definable. This is a sample list. This is not what you're gonna have in your implementation. In all likelihood, yours could look very different. If you're a services-based organization, you might have project or something like that as a code. If you're a not-for-profit, uh, or if you're an organization that deals heavily with uh, grants and their restrictions to track, you might find your dimensions here would be uh, fund, grant, uh, program, or project, and restriction. And then within these dimensions, you'll have multiple values. So you can have eight different dimensions that the system allows you to create, and then underneath any of these, you can have an unlimited number of values. So department here, I've got administration, HR, production, projects, purchasing, sales, and if I wanted to, if I started up a new department for uh, overseas uh, you know, customers or something like that, or an overseas department, I simply come over here and type that in. That's all, no creation of general ledger accounts necessary. What you do have the ability to do on top of this is set defaults so that transaction entry becomes easy. When you use dimensions, it's important that we're capturing dimensions uh, on our requisite screens. So where applicable, you can set some defaults and the system will always adhere to those. So for departments, for instance, I might make a rule that says all my customers will always use the sales department. If I'm doing any transaction that involves the use of a customer record, make sure it goes to my sales department. How do you do that? Come up to account type default dimensions while you're hovering or while you've got departments highlighted. And over here, I'm gonna select from my dropdown table customer. And here I could just say sales. And if I don't want this to change, uh, the user should always be uh, using the sales dimension value. I could say same code. Or if I want to give the user a little bit of liberty, I could say mandatory, but the user might have the ability to change it because if I have an overseas sales, maybe I want to use the overseas bucket or something like that. So you can either set these type of defaults right over here, or when you're setting up your master records in Dynamics 365, uh, you could do that on the customer master, vendor master, item master, chart of accounts, etc. So let's just quickly jump to my customer master, and I am going to do a customer master review as well in just a little bit. So here I'm going to the screen for a very specific purpose. I'm gonna pull up one of my customers, Coho Winery. Okay. 
And when I uh, go to Coho Winery and I click on Navigate up here in the ribbon, you'll see Dimensions. So this is where I get to set some default dimensions. So for Coho Winery, Department will always be maybe Sales. So I can select this and we say, we're not gonna change this ever. Then I come down to my next row and say, when I'm working with Coho Winery, maybe it always is part of customer group medium. And again, select same code. So I could set these defaults so that the transactions <coughs> would inherit these dimensions any time the customer is used. And for another customer, I might have an entirely different uh, set of dimensions. So I leave Coho Winery and then I might go to Tray Research and Tray Research may have different dimensions that, that we utilize. So the department for Tray Dimensions might be still sales. But the customer group might be entirely different. They might be a different size of a customer and I might say this is a large account. So you could set these. So it just becomes one more thing that we create and uh, one more field that we fill when we're populating our masters. And what's really nice in the system is uh, when you're working with workflows, you could ensure that general ledger accounts or customer or vendor accounts when they're created, they are automatically created in a restricted mode. So they must be approved by somebody else before they're used. So somebody in accounting maybe, or an accounting manager, or a, a financial controller, somebody may need to provide oversight and approve that account and maybe even a sales manager. So two people need to approve that account before it can be used or a customer or a vendor and so on. So we create these dimensions and notice here for restriction, for instance, I've got restricted, uh, permanently, temporarily restricted or unrestricted. You'd be able to <coughs> create these buckets. And then when you're running your financial reports, you can either use these dimensions as filters or you can use these as columns in financial reports and you can do some analysis with these as well. So coming over here, leaving my screen, to go back to my financial reports area. So in Dynamics 365 for financials, our reporting, our financial reporting writer and areas called account schedules. So depending on my role center, it might either be in one of my lists right over here. I could go to my finances and see my account schedules or I could have also searched for it. The ones that Microsoft has pre-created start with M. So those are the ones that Microsoft built. The one I showed you in the ribbon, there is a financial reports button. But if I want to create my own or if I want to append something, I could always come here and create as many as I want. Let's just take a quick overview of the report writer and I'll show you how dimensions are used as well. So anytime I want to edit or create a new report, that's financials based, involves the use of general ledger accounts. I'd just come over here for instance and say, edit the account schedule. <coughs> Here's where I define all the different rows. All right, we can set out a reference to a direct account number or some calculation as you see over here. I can also say always show or show if any columns not equal to zero, show opposite sign. <coughs> the reason we're doing this is these are credit accounts and that means that the balances here are always gonna show up as a negative. In a normalized view of numbers, debits are positive and credits are negative. But in a financial report, I wanna see that as negative revenue. So we're gonna show that with a positive sign. Also for printouts, you could say bold, italics, underline, and some other formatting. So we define all these rows. And then what we do with the report writer is we can also set up different column layouts or create column layouts. Here's a simple one. Just one column shows me the net change. I could uh, look at a couple others and even make my own. Maybe I wanna have one around periods. So I could have period, period minus one, period minus two, or I could have actuals versus budgets. And the system does have budgets as well that you can utilize. So you could uh, set up a lot of different types of account, col uh, account uh, column layouts. And then <coughs> simply running this is as simple as coming to the report, highlighting it, clicking on overview. And this shows me my financial report. Now my column layout here, net change is obviously showing me just one column. These amounts in blue are things that I can drill down on and I can see greater detail behind it. I see it comes from a summary account. I click on it, it's gonna show me all the transactions and then I could use Navigate if I wanna see the actual invoice as well. So a lot of neat things that I can do there. Uh, but then if I wanted to set a filter by department, I could come here and say filter by department sales or filter by customer group or filter on a budget if I was doing actuals versus budgets. I can zoom in and out. So month, quarter, year, set different date ranges. Let's say 010117.12, 12, 
only 31.17. And let me change my column layout to be periods. Actually, I think a lot of my demonstration data might be in the year 2019. Let me try that. Oh, well. Yeah, okay, so it's in the year 2017. I just sometimes forget what months they have the demonstration data in. But here as I'm looking at it, current period, current period, minus one, minus two, et cetera. So I can set my filters. A lot of our customers usually want their uh, dimensions to be <coughs> set up as columns. So department sales, department production, department purchasing, you can have those as a column layout as well. If you do want to print these out from here, you do have a print button that you could use to uh, send this out to uh, your, your PDF writer. By design, Microsoft currently prints everything to the PDF uh, format automatically, and then you could, uh, from there, print to your favorite printer. A uh, reason I think this was a bit of a necessity because Microsoft wants to make this available on multiple platforms. People use this from Windows, from Macintosh, or Mac OS, and from Linux, et cetera, and perhaps it's a little bit of a struggle to get everybody's printer drivers covered. So today, everything goes to PDF, which is universal, and from there, you can print to your printer. I know Microsoft's also working on creating your own, you know, printing directly to print drivers in future uh, releases. So that's how your dimensions could be uh, used, and that's how you get the type of breakdown that you may be looking for with Dynamics 365 for financials. Uh, what I want to take on next is a little bit around uh, just journal entries and some of the things you can do there. I'm not going to go through and uh, you know do a full journal entry uh, or you know talk about that in extensive detail, but I want to touch on a couple of things that I get asked about a lot. So to that end, let's go to general journals. And let's see my default uh, general journal. I had created one where I wanted to reclassify an amount from uh, my advertising expense account to my rent expense account. So you see over here, I've got a document number. I referenced my general ledger account number. I'm debiting out uh, or debiting into my rent expense account and debiting out of my advertising expense account. As I'm doing this, if I want to attach a file or something supporting uh, related to it, an approval or whatever, I could do this. I may also require approvals on uh, journal entries before they're posted. So if that is the case, uh, you may have to send an approval requirement to, or send it for approval and the approver would review, approve or reject. Notice too over here, I've got something called save as standard journal or get standard journals. If you wanna memorize journal transactions, you can do those. Uh, so you just type in everything that you need and memorize it. And the next time you need to retrieve it, you say get standard journals and you'd retrieve that from a list of uh, uh, standard, uh, journals that you've already saved. And uh, if you do want to, and you use a lot of recurring transactions, you'll find that there's also recurring transaction management capability in the system. So I could always just go to, that's not over here in this list, so I'm gonna search. So if you have recurring journals, you could create fixed variable, uh, you know, balance, reversing fixed, reversing variable, etc., And you define the detail behind uh, what's happening. You type in all the actual transaction, and you can post the first one today. You would set the recurring frequency. If there's an expiration associated with these so that it stops recurring after a certain time, you could do all those. You could also create and manage allocations underneath these. So the system allows you to save journal entries, allows you to set up recurring journal entries, or just type in or manage uh, journal entries in general, and create supporting documentation associated with that as well. Uh, the system has built-in budgeting capability. So when you're working with general ledger budgets, you can create or uh, manage those inside the pro inside Dynamics 365 for financials. You can also import them or create an export to Excel as a spreadsheet and uh, then populate it and then import it into the system. So here I've got one sample budget. Let's just go ahead and uh, drill into that. And I can have dimensions used in budgets as well. So if you're using those departments and, uh, as, a, as a dimension and you wanted to see a departmental budget, uh, you could uh, create one with a budget filter for department sales, one for department purchasing, et cetera. Uh, you know, export that to Excel and send it to your different business unit managers, uh, your sales department, your purchasing department, et cetera. They'll fill it all in. And you can import that into the system. Uh, you can then, uh, as you're importing that, have multiple people's input cumulatively affect or update somebody else's historical 
uh, you know, budget entries, or you could have them replace if somebody sent you an, you know, an incorrect uh, input before and they're correcting that and adding new information, you could replace the old one. Notice over here, I can set my budgets by uh, either by general ledger account, by period in this view, or I could change the view a little bit if I actually like to see this as department first and then I'm looking at some accounts as a filter. I could filter and say my budget is for the day, week, month, quarter, year. And you can have multiple budgets too. I mean, uh, it, you know, I'm, I've just got one here in my sample, uh, in my sample company, but you may have multiple budgets that you utilize and the system will be just fine with that. Here, if I do want to copy from historicals, I could say copy from another budget, or it could also allow me to copy from actual historical information, maybe with some adjustments. Notice I could say adjustment factor and then copy from actual general ledger entries. So it'll look at my actual that have been posted in the previous month, the previous year, make a 10% adjustment uh, and so on. Maybe some <coughs> summarize that all as one entry for the whole month and, and populate those. So pretty simple and easy to manage. Uh, the budgets are of course pretty important. So that's why I wanted to touch on that. Uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365 for financials also supports multiple currencies. So if you're an organization that buys and sells in different currencies, uh, you could always manage those in the system. Uh, when you're creating and setting up customers and vendors, you could manage those with your desired currency of transaction. You'll see that when I go to a customer or a vendor master. And then over here, you can specify the bucket of currencies that you're, or the basket of currencies that you utilize. So I've got my US dollars already as the default currency in my system, so it doesn't show this in my list. These are non-US dollar currencies that I handle. So you, uh, I've got Canadian dollars, I've got euros, I've got Mexican peso, and so and then I see the exchange rates. I don't have to update these manually. The system's got an internal exchange rate uh, update service. By default, it uses Yahoo exchange rates uh, service. You can also connect it to the European Monetary Bank or to any other service that you like. There's a mapping capability, so if you want to use a third-party service, you could utilize that or you could maintain them manually. It can be scheduled to do a once-a-day update on the currency exchange rates, and you could see a historical ledger of all the currency exchange rates day by day that you've automatically imported. So you could see over a period of time how the currency exchange rates trended. So moving on from here, I'd like our next stop, I think, to be a little bit of a review of a customer vendor, I mean, a customer master, a vendor master, and an item master, and then I'll do a simple transaction. And from there, we'll start uh, moving to our questions and answers phase. So as I bring up a customer event master, notice even before I pull it up, I've got some sales history for the highlighted customer record. Here, as I'm looking at this uh, customer master, of course, I'm seeing some basic information about the customer. Uh, you'll notice I've got these show more prompts in case uh, the, uh, you know, I, the information I'm looking for it doesn't immediately populate. I notice in this example here, we hadn't set a credit limit, so you could assign a credit limit for a customer. I could say this customer has a credit limit of $50,000. I could also assign a salesperson code to it. If you're looking to calculate commissions, uh, you'll notice, or you may remember from when I brought up Microsoft App Source, there are actually a couple of applications in the marketplace for calculating commissions. So uh, it all starts with us finding the right salesperson, and then from there you can use the commissions functionality. Say this is assigned to Net Hill. And if I have some defaults around how they like to receive your documents, I could say uh, send by email or send to direct file. I could pre-create and utilize these profiles. I could see some uh, information about profitability, how much cost uh, of goods I have for this. And you could also notice the balance in the balance view. Anytime I want to see information on something that's linked in blue, I just click on it and it takes me down to the detail. So for this customer, I've got two transactions. You notice I've got one that's in bold, italics, and red. That indicates something that's overdue given my system's date. And the other one is, uh, is still an outstanding invoice, but it's not overdue yet. And then as I scroll to the right, I should be able to see more detail, the original amount, the remaining amount, and so on. And if I actually wanted to see the invoice, I could click on the button and it would show me the associated document in the system if there was one. I think I'd booked some of these as opening entries so there's not a source invoice, but when a source invoice actually exists, it would show me the, uh, the, the, the document. Let's maybe try this one. So 
Let's give it a quick second. So when it brings up that source invoice document, I'd be able to see, make a correction, send another copy of that invoice to a customer. So the customer's requesting another copy of that as I'm looking at it. <laughs> There'll be a send button on that screen as well. Uh, so a lot of things can be managed directly from uh, the from starting from the customer master, then drilling down into some source documents and, and viewing that. My apologies for uh, the, the little bit of slowness that I'm experiencing here. Okay. So while that's happening, uh, let me see if I can, oh, it, it did come up, Never mind. So this <coughs> was a pulled up copy of the invoice. I can correct, cancel, uh, you know, pull up statistics related to this invoice, et cetera, uh, or send another copy. But coming back to this customer ledger entry, I drilled down on, into this from my balance field. Going down a little bit, I've got address management, this is the primary address associated with this customer. This is a contact detail. Now, the system has the ability to track multiple contacts against a particular uh, against a particular customer. So you might have five, six, or ten different contacts with different responsibilities. You can also create and manage multiple shipping addresses. So if you wanted uh, five or ten different shipping addresses <laughs> to be pre-populated, you could maintain and manage that right over here. You can also see information about terms. Uh, and you will see here pricing and discount capability as well. So if you provide special price levels or special discount levels, either against individual customers or if you have contract groups, uh, retail, distribution, uh, wholesalers, and so on, and you provide discounts for those, you would first create things called customer price groups and customer discount groups, et cetera, and then assign them to a customer. You may also have things that are assigned to items. <coughs> so when we look at items, you might see you could group groups of items together and do discount groups for items. And then if you want to see the full matrix associated with this customer, simply scroll down a little bit and you'll see, for instance, this customer by virtue of the uh, fact that we have assigned this discount to all customers. So this customer benefits from it as well, gets a special price on this particular product or gets a special discount of 20%. If you want to create additional discounts or prices, you can either just do that directly from the customer card or an item card, or you can do it from the sales price worksheet, which is like a master list where you populate <coughs> special price levels, special discount levels, et cetera. So if I wanted to create another special price for, or actually a special discount, come over here and I could say when this customer buys, either this item or anything within this item discount group. Oh, well, we don't have a discount group in this example, so let's take another item. If they buy a minimum of 10 pieces of that, we're gonna give them a 15% discount. And I can limit these by dates as well. And if you have different currencies you interact with, you could say these only apply to certain currencies. Further, scrolling down a little bit more, <laughs> tax liability tracking, um, warehouse locations you ship from and so on can also be tracked as well as the statistics. So you can at any point in time look at how your relationship with this customer has been, uh, how much you're selling, uh, how much money you're making off this customer, et cetera, of this relationship. So a lot of things you can do and then key reports will also be mapped up over here. <coughs> so a quick view of cash applied customer statistics, age they are reports, et cetera, specific to this customer are all manageable right over here. Moving on from my customer master, by the way, uh, on the customer record, I may not have come across this field. It's probably one of my show more, but you can also assign the default currency associated with the particular customer. Let me see if it's under, right over here. So if we were to sell goods to this customer always in Canadian dollars or euros, we'd set that up over here. Vendor master, very much like the uh, customer vet master.
when I'm setting up my vendors, a lot of the things I've shown you for customers are already applied to vendors as well. So I won't go to every single field. Uh, note I have the currency uh, information over here. I also have, <coughs> have the ability to manage and track 1099 vendors. I could decide a special check format or a separator, et cetera, a preferred bank to pay them out of. And then in addition to uh, that, I can also run my 1099 reports associated with this vendor. I'll look at the 1099 statistics associated with this vendor record. So uh, all of that is very, you know, easily managed. And finally, the vendor sharing uh, or providing you some special prices or they provide you price books or discounts, you can import that into the system or type them in <coughs> using these uh, invoice discounts and line discounts and prices, matrices, et cetera. With products, let's go to items. In Dynamics 365 for financials, we have um, two types of items. We could have things that are inventory, so things that you carry in stock, and then you could also have things that are services, non inventory So here I've got consulting services as an example. Let's take a look at both. So I'm gonna pull one of my favorite chairs, and here I've got this information showing as in tiles. You've seen that on a lot of my list screens. I could have also just viewed all this detail in a list view. So let's just come back over here. So that's my list of items. If I want to see things in a list view, I can do that or I can present in a slightly different presentation view as well depending on how I'd like to find things. And if you have a lot of items, a lot of customers, vendors, I can search by a product number, product name. So there's a lot of searching and filtering capabilities as well. This is an inventory item, so it's this type inventory. I can track uh, some uh, detail around it. Uh, by default, the system's doing uh, FIFO costing, but Microsoft's also adding average costing to uh, the capabilities very soon. If this product is included in any pricing matrices, or discount matrices, you can click here, you can see all that detail. Uh, if you provide special prices or get special costs or prices from vendors, you can see and manage all of those as well in the system. I can define how I uh, typically acquire more of this product. If I buy this, I can say uh, who I buy from and who my preferred vendor is. And if you're keeping things, you can also track and look at the bill of material associated with this. Of course, I have picture capability. We also have item attributes management that you can create and manage. So attributes essentially uh, are a way for us to say, uh, pre-create some list of attributes where you can either select from a value that's uh, one of a few values like color or measurements, which could be abstract and somebody has to actually measure and type in and then include the unit of measure associated with it. So special prices for items are available. Special discounts are available. Uh, you could you define uh, which inventory accounts are hit, and you can find all the different account detail behind it as well, so you have full control over how reporting would happen in the system. And multiple units of measures are also supported, so you could sell or buy in a unit of measure that's different than your stocking or your base unit of measure. All right now, if I were to go back and look at my consulting services, <coughs> we codified this because we frequently, uh, you know provide consulting services and we maybe want to use that not just as a general ledger account but want to have some count of how many hours we've used of the services over a period of time or in other cases if you are in the healthcare business or hospitality business uh, or you're dealing with a lot of uh, uh, you know items of very nominal value uh, you may use uh, the you know materials management consumables material management uh, methodology and say we want to provide it a number our gloves, our jackets, or something else. Yes, they have a part number, but once we buy them, we might buy them in thousands of, you know, a box of 100 or 1,000, but we don't really care to see every time we pull out a glove from that box or a jacket from that box or a bolt. We don't want to know the count. We just want to know that we bought that with a product number, and uh, when we run out, we'll know there's no in the box, we're going to put another order in. So for those, you could create these non-inventory. So they're just called type service, and uh, you'd still give it a part number, you can give it a part price, you can track how much you paid for it last time. Uh, and you could say the vendor you buy it from by default, you may have some special prices, et cetera, as well. But the system doesn't actually require you to, uh, you know, eliminate values every time or, you know, you know, mark how many pieces you've used to fit and what quantity on hand you've got for it. So those are quick overviews of some master records. Uh, if I want to create a quick quote, 
uh, for an order. Let's actually, in the interest of time, let's do that. If I'm shipping things, I might create an order. If I'm just providing consultant services or some services that don't have partial shipments or don't need to be shipped at all, they're just invoiced, I could go directly to invoices. So let's create a new transaction. I'm gonna select one of my customers, Coho Winery. And uh, if my customer gives me a request of delivery date, I could put that in. They might say they want this by the 1st of March. They might give me a PO number, type that in. I'll select the product that I intend to sell to this customer. This is just a date management related field. My demonstration dates I think are in July. Uh, and then as I come down over here, I could put in the quantity that we're selling to them, 20. And then the system will look at the matrices uh, and it will tell me if there's any special price or discounts, it'll automatically apply them. So the price is 192.80, but notice it's automatically populated a 15% discount. Uh, for those of you who remember, when I was on the customer card, I set up that special discount for, for this customer, right? If they buy, I think, a minimum quantity of uh, so much, then they would get it. And I could always look back over here in my fact box and see some detail as well. I could see they are eligible for one special, uh, no special prices, but one special discount. What is that? This is that line item driving the discount because they bought more than 10 pieces of this. Uh, they're getting a 15% discount. So all of that is here. If you're selling from multiple warehouses, you can track that. Also notice I've got a couple of notifications. The system is warning me that I don't have enough inventory. That might be fine if I'm a distributor and I buy to sell. Uh, also no notifying me that there is an overdue balance for this customer. And I could have, by setting up the appropriate workflows, uh, prevented this from transaction from being fulfilled. Here, it's just a warning. Once I create this transaction, obviously, if I wanted to, uh, don't want to leave my screen yet. If I wanted to select a different shipping address or so on, I could do those. I could send the customer an email confirmation. Uh, and uh, if I am shipping it, I could just ship this. Or if I'm shipping and invoicing, if you're a smaller organization, you could ship an invoice from one screen. Or you might have one person responsible for shipping and one person responsible for invoicing. That's how simple it is to manage a, a, a sales transaction. This was a product, but if you don't deal with products and you deal with services, uh, you could come over here and either just book against a general ledger account uh, for some type of service that you provide. So I could come down over here and again, just directly select from my project sales or some other type of a uh, you know general ledger account that I have, quantity one, and then I'd just be able to type in the amount. You could also use, uh, if you're using labor intensive work, uh, you could select from a full list and you could uh, associate, uh, if you had these service items against consulting services or labor of some type, you could have used those as well. So you might remember we had a consulting services account down there. So for my third one, I'm actually going to use that. Oops. And here, because consultant services rates are predefined on my card, it will automatically inherit that number without me having to do anything. So I can track, purchase, sell, um, you know, services, uh, inventory. And there's also a jobs or, a, you know, a project accounting module, which our time does not permit us to cover today. <coughs> we have fixed assets capability as well. I want to round this up before we go into QA with one last thing, which is Power BI. This is the tool that Microsoft has created for um, on-the-go reporting, as well as the ability to create more complex reports. So when you are using Microsoft Dynamics 365 for financials, you can set up and uh, manage Power BI for the entire organization uh, at an extra $10 a user a month, or if you just wanna be a user and create reports for yourself, you can do that at no cost. So this information, however, was pre-created by Microsoft for financials. So all I did is when I signed up for Power BI, which is through my Office 365 services, I came to get services and I said, financials. And Microsoft has about eight different pre-created content packs. So each one of these is a pre-created template or a placeholder with some pre-filled reports. All we do is then say, get it now, put in our company's uh, URL in financials and our username and password, and it fills it with our data. <coughs> And then we can schedule these refreshes to happen once a day, you know, or if you're paying the $10 a user a month, once an hour. You could take this on your phone or your tablet. Power BI is a free application that you can download uh, on your iPhone or iPad. 
or Android tablets or Windows tablets and phones. And as you look at any of these dashboards or reports, you just click on something, you can hover or look under greater detail or click on it and it takes you to all the other types of related reports where you can filter on dates and so on. Uh, you can create reports of your own. So it's a complete report writer in its own right. So for people who are business analysts would benefit from just coming to the screen, utilizing uh, visualizations, utilizing these queries to very quickly put together a chart, a list of accounts and balances, et cetera, right over here and then publish and share them with other people in your organization. So you can share these and say share with. Uh, you also have some capabilities for natural language inquiry where you can type in balance at date actual last year or net change forecast. These are some examples and uh, you'd be able to kind of run these and you know, where applicable will actually show you the uh, information. I realize it's uh, 30 minutes past the hour. We've reached the logical end of our time, but I do want to make some time for questions and answers. So I am going to stay over here on the phone call for another five or 10 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions at this time, you can utilize the chat or the questions uh, window that you see in the go to webinar or the go to webinar control panel. I'm also going to bring up my screen that has the email addresses for our sales team. My email address is up here as well. And we have a special dedicated website for Dynamics 365 called interdynedmid365.com, where we have <coughs> more information on licensing, our implementation options, as well as uh, our blog, uh, or the ability to quickly sign up for a trial for Dynamics 365 if you are so interested. Opening the floor for any questions that you may have now. All right, the first question I have is about length of subscription. Uh, can we subscribe to this software for month by month or does it need to be an annual subscription? Oh, there's no uh, restriction on monthly subscriptions. Obviously, most organizations will invest in this product for and plan to use this for, you know, uh, for a stable amount of time. Uh, so we do have customers who do sometimes subscribe for an entire year, uh, but the pricing is very simple. It's the same uh, and you could pay monthly uh, and Interdine BMI could set you up on a monthly billing program. Services, even though you didn't ask about that, if you are using the um, the Smart Start plan, which is fixed price, then you, you do pay that upfront. It's one of the upfront costs along with your first month subscription fees. Additional questions? All right, looks like we've got a shy audience today. My email address and our sales team's email address is up here. Um, reach out to us. We'd love to learn more about how we can help you or how Dynamics 365 for Financials can help you. Uh, if you are using an existing system like Microsoft or an existing Microsoft product like Dynamics GP or Dynamics SL, uh, talk to us about some specials that you may be able to benefit from as you're transitioning. Or if you're a QuickBooks user or a user of another system uh, like NetSuite or Epic Core 2, just talk to us uh, and we can talk to you about some of the advantages that you may uh, you know, find for uh, moving from those systems into a robust and dynamic product like 365 for financials. I'll thank you all for your time once again. Uh, we hope to see you again in another one of our presentations. We do repeat these product tours once every other month. Uh, and we have a large series of webinars that we uh, manage over the course of the year. Uh, and various uh, around various products that we sell and implement. So do uh, stay tuned and thank you for attending. Have a wonderful afternoon. Oh, 